any any anything like that. Yeah, I can't guarantee there will be any F bombs, but what a fun week. Okay. Because I always give a few minutes. I if people are watching us and you're watching this on YouTube, I know because you know what I hate when I listen to a podcast, how it takes forever for them to get to the point and to like get to the <laughs> get to the guests. Okay. But I have this feeling that I do the same thing. And I only do it though because it takes Facebook a few minutes to get everybody notified. So I kind of waste a little bit of time at the beginning. But if you're watching it after on YouTube, you're probably like, shut up and just get to the rep so they can talk about books. <laughs> Maybe that's what the podcasts are trying to do that we don't know. They're trying that's to That's true. That's I kind of doubt it though, because of recording. But anyways. <laughs> oh, no, yeah, you're right. Nice, nice, nice thought there, Tom. Anyways, so two things happen again this week. So Y'all are so famous. And we had a group of, this is their second annual trip down to Warwick. This group of, and I don't know if you're watching live with us. I don't see you right now because I haven't gone off to that screen. So if you're commenting, I can't see it yet. Um, I'll look at that once Tom starts. Um, this group of, a, but there were about 10 of these ladies that make a road trip from Orange County down to Warwick with a list of books wow. that they're going to buy from us and it's not they don't just buy one book for the whole group these each of these ladies had stacks of books that were books that we all talked about on tea time that were authors that we had like virtual events for and other events so ladies if you're watching i had so much fun it was like being like giving candy out because I was like, I every book I was talking about, oh, and you need to read this one, and you need to read that one, and you need to read this one. It was the most fun I had book selling in a long time. It was that's great. It was really that really is fun. fantastic. Yeah, I love that. Oh, so great. So it's all worth your time doing this every week with us, you guys. <laughs> we knew that already, but now I know. It's here. But it really <laughs> makes it. It really makes it brings it home when it's just like I mean, I I came out because I'm rarely at the store. And I came out and there was this group of ladies and I was like, they were talking books and I like accosted them. I was like, who are you and why are you here? And I want to talk to you. <laughs> and let's, let's, let's talk books. Um, and then That's the other awesome. thing that happened was in the wild, we're at another event and I had this person come up and go, I, I don't know, are you the one that does tea time? <laughs> I'm like, yep. Yeah. That's me. <laughs> Sorry. One, of, one of the things you do, not the one only. Of the thing. One of the things. So it's really fun. So I we're three years into this, and hopefully we'll just keep doing it and keep going because it's really fun. So today, so, go ahead, talk. Well, I was going to say you can keep talking about how great we are for another five minutes if you'd like to just keep keep going. Right. right? Yeah. No rush. But I, but I think it's one of those things where I like I know that this is time consuming for you guys to do, and it's like. But I want y'all to know that it's like really, it's got results on the back end of it. You know what I mean? It's it is good to hear. We're not just talking into a void. And then that's why we're doing it for the chatter. <laughs> for the chat. It's all cut. Okay, I just did. Did you are you guys playing that new game connections? Deborah is, not me. Okay. No. So sure, today's <laughs> today, one of them was cheddar, which stood for money. And I had no idea that money was called cheddar. How did I not know that? It's like, where, where do we get this? Oh, I can just drop the F plot for y'all, just in case you want. <laughs> I don't need another game, but where is this one? It's in the New York Times, but it's called Connections. Oh, it's oh, I'm already it's doing words all that are connected. Time, apparently, so it's how the words how words are connected. It's good. Oh, it's a good one. All right, it's gonna go Tom, Andrea, Gabe, Julia. So Tom, let me put the screen. You don't screen share that, Tom. So, um, but take it away. Okay. Oh. But now I know I've, I'll be playing that game, so I'm losing more valuable reading time. But I'll it's, piss on. it doesn't take that long. They're really okay, good. Yeah, it good. doesn't take that long. So, so my first book is from Penguin Press. It's out tomorrow. It's called <laughs> The Country of the Blind uh, by Andrew Leland. And, and Gabe, a few weeks ago, I think, was talking about books like this, books about someone who's going through something like this, a memoir. And not always do you feel like it's, you know, deserve this book length form, but a writer. And so he has what's called retinitis pigmentosa. He's known, he's, he's known that he has it since his teenage years. And so it is a, his, basically his eyesight is shrinking a little bit at a time. And, and of course, every person's different. So 
But at this point, um, you know, he's had it for decades. And so, so it's about that. It's about that experience uh, of, blind, of, of, coming, of, of coming blindness, um, but also very thoughtful. And in terms of uh, what's happening to him and in terms of his whole family, his wife and child, um, all of that is a great part of the book. Plus there's history, the history of blindness and writers with blindness. So there's a big section on Borges. Um, it's a really meaty, uh, important book about disability. So it's, uh, it's more than just blindness, I feel like. It's, uh, it's a book, that, but it's a book that all of us can read and get a lot from regardless of. I mean, it is as readers and as writers, that's one of my biggest fears, but um, but it's fascinating to watch the kind of the bravery that it takes to face every day and to write this book. He had to think about, you know, how how long is it going to take to write the book? How did Tom freeze on us? And also, but it's did I freeze for a minute? Okay, well, to to say that it's entertaining, you know. It is entertaining. He's a really good, he's a really entertaining writer. Um, as About a really tough topic. Yeah, as difficult as it, as the topic is. Um, so amazing, it's just out tomorrow. It's gonna get amazing reviews. It's a big inter interview with him in the New York Times that just uh, went live this afternoon. So out tomorrow, The Country of the Blind by Andrew Leon. Wow, sounds like a really powerful one. It, it, it is, yeah. yeah. Amazing. Okay, we already got a couple comments in. So Beth Johnson's asking, how worried should we all be about the UPS strike? Worried. Um, worried. We're, worried. we're worried, but we're cautiously optimistic. Let's put it that way. Because I think- Here's my- Go ahead. Here's my thing. You should still go into your indie bookstore and buy the books that you had no yeah. idea existed that are on their shelves because yeah. it's indies- get ship books mostly from UPS. So it is going to affect Indies probably greater than some of the other ones that pick up uh, their book that own, say, a trucking company as well. Um, and, <laughs> and pick up their books. They who shall not be named <laughs> the evil <laughs> empire. Uh, I'm, beating around, I'm beating around the name. Um, but uh, but so uh, my my advice to people is to just have an open mind when you go into your Indies for the next at least probably a few weeks to a month, hopefully. Um, and, uh, and you know, let them find you something fun that, that yeah. is on the shelf. Yes. That's kind of our take too on it. I mean, we're not, we're not sending a bunch of stuff back. Um, I appreciate some of the people that are on here though, actually order books from us and we ship them to them. So that, but we ship UP, we ship postal, we ship UPS. So we don't ship um, USPS. USP. US, yeah, we are USPS. So we don't yeah. ship to you. Well, I mean, there will be slowdowns in area, you know, for yeah. every other shipping outfit because of the strike. Right. Yeah. But, uh, our, but our Intel's kind of, I mean, like we got the, I got the Intel on for you. <laughs> We, the publishers have adjusted. We're we're going to ship stuff out early. Um, right. We've got a promotion so people can stock up so they can pay us later right. than usual. Right. There's all kinds and of. And I think that there's a couple. Things. There's a couple on the word on the street driver. You know where our drivers stuff. They they really think if it lasts more than two or three days, they're going to be surprised. Um, it's going well, mean, it's it's to cause such a massive disruption. Even in, in that two or three days. Yeah. I mean, you know. Um, even though we are in a, a very important industry, there are a lot of very vital things like uh, right. livers, you know, right. that are getting Medicine. transplanted that need to go overnight UPS um, to another hospital across the country. And I mean, this is like this disruption is so huge and it's global. Right. I, I just think that there's, you know, I think the government will get involved to get these people to work things out. Let, you know, right. fingers crossed. Right. So that's I so that's our little take on that. Plenty of and books. Julia, like you just said. No, plenty of books. You don't have to worry. You can find something yeah. else. There's, there's something to read. We yeah. will have something, we will have something for you to read. It might not be exactly what you want at that particular moment, but guaranteed we'll have something for you. Well, read. you know what we should do if the looming strike does occur, we should do um our backlist gems. What's on the shelf? What's on the shelf? Yeah. Um, you know, all of uh, yeah. what 
um, for folks, um, for readers out there, backlist is basically just stuff that has shipped um, right. previously. It could be five years old. It could have been last season, but that's backlist. And um, frontlist is the books we're talking about that are forthcoming and, you know, coming out right now. Right. And so we should do a, like a backlist gems. Um, yeah. That might be, we, might, we, we might need to do that the week that the strike might happen. Yeah. So that would be the first week of August. Julia, I just want you to say that Beth Johnson said, Beth Johnson also says, welcome back and that glad we didn't scare you away. So <laughs> oh, oh, thank you, Beth. Not I was a little worried when you, you weren't here when I got joined and I was like, uh-oh. No. Uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> what did I say? What did we say? Yeah. Do we, do we, do we? Oh, you know what I was, you know what my biggest fear is? I sometimes will think afterwards, it's like, because we talk some dirt afterwards, just letting y'all know <laughs> when we're off, when we're off. And it's like, were we live when we were talking about that? <laughs> oh yeah. I have had that fear for three years. Oh yeah. We weren't really recording when I said that. Were we? <laughs> Anyway, yeah, you gotta blow off steam somehow. You somewhere. gotta, and these are my people here, so this is where I've gotta like blow the steam. So anyway, so Andrea, what do you got for us this week? Oh goodness, I'm not even prepared. I'm just sitting here shooting. <laughs> <laughs> this is funny. Um, yes, I'm a little rusty. Um, okay, so um, wanted to talk about um, James Lee Burke's <laughs> new book, Flags on the Bayou. Um. And um, readers are familiar with his work. Um, and this is the first, this is actually the first book that uh, Atlantic Monthly slash Grove, Grove Atlantic um, has published of his. And um, we have about 10 copies that just arrived um, signed by the author at Warwick's. Um, so that's nice. It's a um, nice value added on that. Um, and this is set in the Civil War era era Louisiana. Um, so it's a little bit of a um, departure for him, but there still is a mystery element. Um, and um, it involves enslaved and free women, um, uh, highfalutin plantation gentry who are not happy with the way the Civil War is going. <laughs> um, Confederate and Union soldiers. It's a great cast of character. And um, it's just um, a really great novel. Um, I would say that this is for readers of um, Cold Mountain from back mm -hmm. in the day, Charles Frazier's um, masterful um, look at the South during um, this period. So um, nice cover here. And um, we're pretty excited about this. And it's nice that, um, that you all um, went for the the ten copy signed first edition carton from the author. So thanks for that. And we that's love just, that. we love those signed editions. Yeah, and it's just really nice to um, you know send you know uh, extend that to your customers. So that's um, twenty eight dollars, and um, it is out now. Awesome. I've always loved James Lee Burke. I haven't read him for so long, but he's. Great yeah. mystery writer, but he's just a this generation of mystery writers that could just write the hell out of a novel. Yeah, I mean, he just, I mean, I don't think this is what I think. I think that um, to write good quote unquote genre fiction, you have to know how to write a novel. Yeah, that's right. it. Right. You have to be a master to like to get a genre down. You have to be a master, and so you better know how to write a novel. It's like somebody who is doing modern art better know how to draw figures right you know, same thing don't need to so can't go wrong with this uh more of yep. a historical novel here so awesome Love uh, him. He's, a, he's a he's a really great writer i think uh yep. he did that one the confederate um, generals and the, con the confederate generals in the electric mist which oh, yeah. i read the thing and i'm like there's just no way he's gonna this is gonna work for me uh, and i love the dave rubishow books uh, and when yeah. I when I finished that, I'm like, hey, it was a great book. He's a great writer. He could do whatever the hell he wants because he is beyond yeah. genre. He's yeah. such a good writer. Yeah, I mean, he's just, you know, a, a, an American master. And, um, you know, there are so many great contemporary American authors. It's like hard to keep track of. And so it's nice that um, we get to feature uh, this latest from him. So, yeah, awesome. Okay, Gabe. 
what surprises do you have for us this week? I've, I've got plenty of stuff for you, but my first book is The Life We Choose um, by uh, Matt Birkbeck. So I, you know, I was looking at this book and I, I, I don't know why, you know, in your whole life, you read a lot of different things. And I completely have blacked out this portion of like my middle school years and early high school years where I don't know why I haven't thought about it forever. And I looked at this book and I realized, oh my God, I forgot I had ran that like three, four, five years where I read a lot of mob books, a hmm. lot of mafia books, a lot of them. It was like, whoa, <laughs> you grow up fast reading mob, mafia but books. But there was a lot of good ones back in the day. Man. They were, man, but they were some graphic stuff and they were some <laughs> bad dudes, man. And I, so, yeah, so I was like a little more grown up than I should have been because they were cutting out body parts. Hey, I was reading cow, even cowgirls get the blues back then too. So yeah. there we go. Not Just saying. Har Harper author, Mara author. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, this is the life. It is uh, originally not a major player in the uh, in the world. Willie Delia or Big Billy Delia was uh, sort of like the right hand man of this uh, uh, Pennsylvania mob boss. Uh, uh, Russell Buffalino in uh, out of Pittston. So the interesting thing about so Delia eventually became the mob, the head of the mob. The, uh, everybody got arrested. Russell's son took over the mob, and then Russell got arrested, and Big Billy took over. <laughs> and uh, uh, so we see how things can shift and how things can change with a with a death or an arrest and uh, the power structure of the mob. But but what this is so funny about this book is or fun about this book is that uh, Buffalino had this kind of a major empire and he was seen by the feds as sort of this small timer because he's like in Pittston. Now, if you want good Italian food in the mountains of Pennsylvania, go to Pittston. But there's a there's a Pittston's got its reputation. Uh, so that's where he. That's where uh, Russ was uh, was uh, situated, and so yeah, it's not he can't be hardly that big, but he had a long arm, and he had relationships with people like Suge Knight. He had relationships with uh, Frank Sinatra, um, Marlon Brando. Uh, uh, Buffalino may have or may not have been involved in the disappearance of Jimmy Hoffa. So there's some really good stuff in here, and if you like a mob book, again, we talked about true crime. It has turned a corner, and yeah, this is that. But I, I, man, it's just a good old fashioned, like Nicholas Pileggi, uh, that kind of a you know, down and dirty. This is what mobsters do. This is who mobsters are, um, and it's just you know, shocking and uh, a lot of fun. And you're such a bunch of momos doing their thing, and how do they get away <laughs> with stuff for so long? And they they're get away, very, and they somehow do get away with it. And they're not very terribly bright folks, but they're wily enough, you know. They're right. wily and clever, and and murders. So. And, and they just happen to have just on the side. Yeah. Good, on the side. good persuasion little, skills. Just a little murder on the side. Yeah. <laughs> What's a little murder amongst friends? It's a little murder uh, amongst friends. Okay, um, everybody's loving our idea of um, backlist special. So I think that I think that the. Um, the strike's supposed to happen, is it the 1st of August? Mm -hmm. So I think we just do that week. We do backlist. So I'll send a note out to everybody, just as a reminder, though. I think remind we'll, us. Remind yeah, you guys. We just, uh, you know, ch double check to make sure you have that in the stuff in stock. And Well, that's true, too. Yeah. <laughs> you order it from Ingram and they have, they don't use you here. <laughs> yes, they do. Do they? Yeah. I thought they had their own delivery people things. Oh no, no, it gets to uh, no. It, it used to be that we would get this, we would get a delivery guy because that's how we used to get them every day is a guy yeah. from um LA would drive it down, but it would get yeah. how it would get to LA was by UPS and then we have uh, a courier. Courier's not doing it anymore. So I'm, I'm yeah, something happened. I think they may have been from Pittston, Pennsylvania. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sure. Allegedly, you gotta be impossible. We don't, have, don't know for we sure. Had, we don't have next day from Ingram. Pretty sure. Okay. So, Julia, without further okay. ado, 20 minutes later, we finally are getting to you. Yeah, no, it's fine. Um, so, my first book is The Imposters by Tom Rockman. Um, so, this is, first of all, Tom Rockman, if you haven't read some of his earlier works, The Imperfectionist is one of my favorite books. So good. It's so, so good. fun. And it's so like 
this uh, this book has like some of the best parts of the imperfectionist in that like it's full of these like very flawed characters that you're really rooting for even though they're like kind of not making the best choices but you're like but I really hope that you <laughs> start making better choices <laughs> but I'm, I'm here for the ride um and it's about an author a sort of um aging author who knows that she is slowly like getting the um getting dementia and so she's trying to write her last book before she sort of can't write anymore. And it's this kind of great cast of characters that end up in the book. So you see the actual things that are going on and then see how they kind of get worked into this book that she's writing. It's a really beautiful novel. Um, it's a really fun novel, uh, one that, you know, you can definitely take to the beach, but um, is maybe a little bit, a little bit more um, in depth than some beach reads, um, which is not a dig against anyone in, no. <laughs> involved. Um, no, but uh, just a really great one. I really, I really love um, Tom's work, and this book uh, is one of his greats. Yep. No, great so thinker. glad that that one's out because the imperfectionist is so good. So if you <laughs> read this one, but then after you read this one, go back and read the imperfectionist because it's, yeah. it's worth there. There's a backlist gem for you. That <laughs> is a backlist. Yeah, already started, right? Also, um, get to get back to podcasts, um, Julia has a podcast and she does not um, him and ha at the beginning of it. That's right to the, they're that's not, right to the not, point. They're not, right waiting. The point? They're not did, waiting yeah. for, for people to get there. I <laughs> love that. Okay, sorry, Julia. I was I was I was yeah. broad brushing podcasters, <laughs> a, which I should not have done that. <laughs> See, Julie, Julia's not coming back now because not coming back now. Like, said well, about and I hope I didn't like embarrass you or anything by no. like, revealing that because I think not it's cool. All. I mean, you're. I think a, we talked about last week. What's many the name of again? Um, my podcast was called Dawson's Critique. That's right. Because we talked yeah. about yeah. Because you brought up a book last week of Dawson's. I brought Creek. a book about Dawson's Creek. Yes, I did. <laughs> I love that. I, I remain ever on brand. <laughs> well, it's also okay. So I am going to like just throw some other people under the bus. It's like when you go to get a recipe from one of the blogs, and you have to read through this entire blog to get to the recipe. <laughs> oh, yeah, just want the recipe. Just want the recipe. But I have a little hyperlink that says "jump to recipe," and I immediately yeah. jump. Jump to recipe. <laughs> And Julia, where's your Dawson's Creek book for this week? I'm assuming we'll get one every week. But... I don't have, I know. I did <laughs> write, I did technically write one that Andrea distributes. Um, yeah. So <laughs> another backlist oh, gem. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. All right, Tom, what you got next? Week? Okay. So my next book is a really fun thriller called How Can I Help You? You see that library card? <laughs> um or the you know i just saw this today where did i just see this today i saw this somewhere probably i don't know a review don't know. Or something. so yeah it's i love you know we all love books about bookstores but also libraries so we have two like it's the book is told in alternating voices two librarians um margo who has been working at the library she is a former nurse with a trail of deaths in her past but no one knows she's under she has a different name until patricia becomes joins the library and she's a failed novelist she's a writer she's trying always trying to look for material and she she's she started well there are there are deaths in the library there start to be deaths in the library and patricia is on the case so it's a cat and mouse between the two librarians um so you get a lot of the inside detail of the library and the the patrons and all of that while you're also reading this really entertaining yeah, thriller. Not sure how it's gonna how which one is gonna win in the end. Um, really, really fun. And so, like the early PW review said, this brilliant slice of psycho psychological suspense. Sims skillfully alternates between the perspectives of the two women. Patricia Highsmith, Highsmith fans will savor this unforgettable thriller. And then tea time favorite Mona Wad said, a dark and spellbinding <laughs> descent into jolly madness, reminiscent of Shirley Jackson at her eerie best. All of Sim's deliciously wicked powers are on full display in this compulsive and unforgettable novel. And you can read it. It goes by so fast. You really can read it in one or two sittings. How can I help you? I Yeah, I wrote that down somewhere this morning because I saw that. I don't know what I was looking through, but I saw it. I was like, oh, that sounds really good. It's yeah. really, really fun. 
I mean, yeah. that is that is perfect. Okay. It's a real. It's a totally brilliant idea. I don't know how someone hasn't already done it. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant cool. idea. All right, Andrea. Um, I want to talk about this really incredible book. Hermes. The Hermes Am I backwards? Yeah. No. Upside down. down. We got it. Um, the story of Hermit, the Hermes scarf, and um, I'm going to show you some. I'm going to share my screen because it's pretty. It's really beautiful. Well, didn't the designer of the Birkin die today? Yes, yesterday, I think. Jane yesterday. Birkin. Yes. Yeah. yeah, Jane. Yeah, she passed away. Uh, God rest her. So, um, this is a really great book. You've um, uh, you've been reordering this book because um, your customers are loving it so much. Yep. It's really great. It's a sixteen ninety five, as you can see, small format hardcover um and it is just really beautifully illustrated and um i've been flipping through it a lot i am a scarf aficionado um i don't have one on today because it's like you know 200 degrees or outside or something nice. um but this is just such a gorgeous book um and i love how it goes through the different eras of the hermes scarf and i mean come on i mean they're just so it's so beautiful. It shows how different people wear them. Um, anyway, this is just a great little um, hostess gift, I would mm -hmm. say. Um, a nice stocking stuffer, um, something that, you know, like you're meeting friends out for a glass of wine after visiting Warwick's books. You take your friends a couple, you know, one of these, buy a couple of copies. It's just, I think this is going to do really well throughout the holiday. I was going to say the same thing. Yep. Yep. And um, I'm just happy that um, somebody at the store, thank you, Warwick bookseller, <clears throat> put this in the right place because it seems to be selling like hotcakes and there's more yep. on order and there's some in the store right now. So perfect. Yeah, no, that yep. is a perfect for our customers. A little hardback. Yep, it's a little hardback, and um, that's from um, uh, Orange Hippo, which is an imprint of Welbeck, and they do, um, they're from um, Great Britain, and they do a lot of um, really good, they, they package a lot of books from different publishers, and they just, they actually, their uh, production values are pretty darn high. That is a, a deal. I know, it's, it's a really good deal. deal. I mean, there's... Um, like they have like uh, this line, these little um, art and design and architecture books, incredible. I mean, you know, like the Gary or the Eames. I mean, these are just, it's in a similar vein and these okay. are just really great to just, you know, pick up. Great and, little gift, great little, yeah. like you said, hostess gift books. Perfect. Yeah, nice. yeah, yeah. I so, didn't want to open the door for Andrew to show us her whole library out there. I know, well, I mean, that's that? okay. I'm working it today, Gabe. I love it. it. Come on now, <laughs> like Gabe. Come oh. on, you're the master of that, Gabe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've just, I've just learned a few tricks from you, Gabe. That's exactly. all. That's, that's all. what I'm thinking. And I, uh, we already know from it, from his PowerPoint that he's going to do it later in the later in the show. <laughs> <laughs> so there might be an extra book somewhere. Your little tricks. Are, everybody's picking up on your tricks, my yeah, friend. Yeah, try to be sublim subliminal, but you guys are paying attention. <laughs> But Tom, to your book, um, how can I help you? Kim LaRue on here, who's a librarian, she said all the librarians have all been talking about this book. Oh, so I bet. It's going to blow up course. through that world. Yep. Of it's course. a perfect book for that world. Absolutely. Okay, I mean, it sounds Gabe, like a lot of fun. Which, how many books are you talking about this time? Relax, girl. We'll get there. We'll get there when we get there, Jules. All just right. sit back and enjoy the ride. All right, let me just sit back. Um, so Daniel Silva needs no introduction. I just want to, I got a bunch of signed books in there. I need you guys to go pick some up because there's big stacks. There might be like two stacks and there might be some in the back room because uh, Warwick's loves. Uh, we do, we do love our Daniel Silva. He just works. Uh, he's got a new book set in, uh, looks like Venice. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, he's always jet setting. So in this book, uh, Gabriel Alon, the uh, Israeli super spy is uh, partnered with a, another art uh, expert and they're on the trail of uh, stolen art and lost masterworks but somehow get involved in a situation where Russia all of a sudden becomes a danger to the world and who's going to step up and fix it only one man can do it Gabriel Allen so you get you know what you're getting you've been waiting on it 
go get it, take it to bed, take it to the beach, take it on a plane. He's the best. He really is good. I mean, you, you can't go wrong with good summer read, Paige Turner, Daniel Silva. You've got it. Okay, Julia. And now for something completely different. Um, this is uh, Palo Alto. This is, um, I, I love a history slash uh, sociolog sociological study kind of book. So this is, and I grew up in the Bay Area, not too far from Palo Alto, though eons away um, <laughs> in, certain, in certain respects. Um, and uh, so this is about, it is a history of Palo Alto and how it sort of came to be, you know, that area um, was, I mean, my grandfather used to pick apricots uh, to be canned in that area and walnuts and things like that um, for the canneries. And then these sort of small suburbs of San Francisco and of San Jose <laughs> sort of opened and Palo Alto was one of them, um, you know, and obviously a lot of it grew up around Stanford University, but it talks about Palo Alto is the, the most expensive place in the country to live um and is the highest sort of per capita earning people the people in Palo Alto earn the highest per capita in the U.S. um and so talks about Palo Alto as sort of this like on the one hand like did they win capitalism yes but did they really <laughs> maybe not um so it's a great sort of look at um wealth and wealth inequality because of course if you know Palo Alto at all you know on the other side of the freeway is East Palo Alto which is not a rich area um and uh so talks about sort of Palo Alto in a more philosophical way as well as the history of how this town um you know grew and in doing so it's sort of um a history of the whole U.S. and possibly you know major metropolitan areas all over the place um that are sort of seeing these huge rises in in um, housing costs and food costs and transportation costs and things like that. So um, it's a really, it's, it is kind of a meaty, it's a meaty read. You can see it's a little bit thick, um, but uh, who doesn't love a thick and juicy um, history uh, to um, read after they read Daniel Silva? <laughs> <laughs> well, but also I think it's, it, it, I don't know if it touches on this, but if it touches on the whole capitalism thing, it's, you know, it what's happening in all the strikes that are happening up in Hollywood and in the, in the yeah. wage inequality and all, you know, trickle down economics doesn't quite work folks. Right. And it's, yeah. and, and it right. talks about, I mean, it's, you know, that's obviously a lot of what we see happening in Hollywood right now is tied to the tech business and, and Palo Alto is ground zero, you right. know, people are so it's so funny because I, I grew up in a Cal Berkeley family. So Palo Alto was like, we didn't, we don't go there. Oh, like right. we don't. Yeah. yeah. My mom used to hiss at the sign when we <laughs> drove past it on the freeway because she went to Cal. Um, so yeah, talk about two warring factions between like Berkeley and Palo. I mean, you can't get really. Yeah. Too, too. Yeah. I mean, Stanford. I think the um, the um, sections of this book that deal with um, Stanford or, uh, and the history of Stanford are really um, illuminating and disturbing yeah um, because of the um, eugenics uh, oh there's God. like there's eugenics connections with um, some of the early um, folks running Stanford um, how that yep. uh, dovetails into what's going on right now with some of um, the more yep. um, bat bleep crazy um founders of some of these tech companies and um i've i've heard him interviewed a couple of times now on um some podcasts and he's just really brilliant and yeah. um, this is a great overview um and i think it's a book that um uh should be on anybody's like reading list that's um you know concerned with what's going on in um tech's uh uh like it's it's uh effect on our democracy basically and For whether sure. or not we're going to be able to continue having a democracy we're not going to be able to reel this in this the the it is it is out the, the bar out. door is open <laughs> well and it's readable i mean you know as yeah. andrea said it's like very readable so even if it's yeah. sometimes those chunky histories like i have a degree in history and sometimes those chunky histories 
I'm like, no, thank you. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but right. even though this, this is history, is it's, it's it's relevant to what we're all living through right now. And yeah, to your point, Andrea, eugenics, you know, we were doing that well before Hitler was. He got his idea from us on that. Yeah. yeah. Thanks very much. That, yeah. And then we, do, then we got Oppenheimer, who, you know, we're the only country that actually dropped that bomb on anybody. It was yeah. Like, Holy schmoly moly. And then yeah. AI coming, or is here. Yeah. There's that other book, California Slave State, um, that's yeah, out yeah. there. Oh, yeah. Malcolm Harris is a real, is a fun writer. He's uh, easy to read. I, I didn't read a lot of it. I read a chunk of it. Uh, his, one of his previous books. Um, uh, I, it's got a, I wouldn't even say the title. I could say the title. Shit is All fucking, right. and it's bu everything's bullshit or something like that. Um, but very readable. And he's on the edge. And he's young. Right. Yeah, he is. Yeah. I mean, he's got a really interesting mind, but he can synthesize a lot of different ideas um, and put a, and put them in, uh, you know, uh, a readable narrative that's interesting. We, we need the right. So I think that's a very listen. important document, really. I think it's an important book. For sure. Thanks, Andrew. OK, Tom. All right. Lightning round. Lightning round. Is, Can this, we that was lightning? that was a good introduction to my next book, which is called Under the Eye of Power. Subtitle, How Fear of Secret Society Shapes American Democracy. So Colin Dickey is Just a, a very light little read here. I know. <laughs> it's super, it, it, honestly, it's it's so- Fascinating. Lightning and entertaining because what his, he, so he's carved out a, he, he's, he's, a, he's not a, like a historian, but he's writing about history in a very accessible way about, about America. And so Ghostland was about ghost places where there are ghosts. Uh, that was his first book. Uh, then there was The Unidentified, which is things that we be had believed in, like Bigfoot, things like that. This book is goes right to what makes us tick as a country, and that's paranoia. And it has from the very beginning, which I guess I knew, but it's good to be reminded that um, the American Revolution was thought by some to be a conspiracy organized by the French. Uh, we all know about the Salem witch trials. Um, the, there's the Illuminati, there's, there was a, um, they, he talks, there's a whole section on Lincoln. Lincoln was connected to a couple of different theories, but one of them was, uh, I guess it, Lincoln relied on a, sl the popular slave power conspiracy theory to help get him elected. So we're a country that looks for outside forces that are, that are, we, that we can't control that are destroying our beloved country. That's kind of the history of the country. So when we have are confronted now with what we're confronted by, we shouldn't be surprised. Um, it's in our DNA. And the less, uh, the less information we have, the more we deeply we believe in the, right. in the theory. We right. see that. We you know, so that. the less, yeah, it's crazy. It, the book is crazy because it really, so many theories I've never heard of, but it, you know, it really reinforces the famous Richard Hofstadter book called the the paranoid uh the paranoid style of american politics i think it was which is which is what you know you really have we really have to face up to it so anyway but it's a really entertaining history of the country told through and maybe if we understand that this is who we are we'll be less afraid of what's happening all around us because it's always been happening we've always uh, had crazies yeah. yeah so that's under the eye of power by colin dickey yeah he's, so uh, he's a cool dude he's a great writer and a yeah. very interesting uh um supple mind yes yeah. Yes, yeah, I like him. So that's I cool. have my my. I have to pick my book club pick for Wednesday. I'm like starting to think this that might be it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I might send a message, right? <laughs> but it could be. I think it's going to be a great conversation. I mean, yeah, right. I totally. mean, and, and we've we've always looked for like there's a whole section on um, Catholics after the Civil War. They were the focus of. Uh, I know. Well, and, and me growing up Catholic, when I did, I I sensed in my parents this this uh, sense of being uh, outcast or something at one that there was in their DNA, they were, yeah. but I didn't feel that, but anyway. Well, yeah, it's all I mean, weird. the KKK uh, were seriously against Catholics. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. it was like, that. They, they were like the number two, you know, most- It always used to group. puzzle my sister that she was like, how come Christians don't like Catholics? I'm like, oh, Val. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's like, aren't we, aren't we Christian? You've got, too? You've got a couple. How hours. much time do you have? Well, <laughs> and the fear, the fear, the fear of the Vatican controlling this country. I didn't realize how far back it went. It goes back into the 1800s. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I I can't wait. This I might mm, I might. Mm. <laughs> I was I was flipping through some ideas, but this one might have just trumped them all. Really okay, good. Andrea. So this is um, Julia's <laughs> Love this is Julia's book um, co-written with Aaron <laughs> Hensley. I My remember college everything. Life lessons roommate. from Dawson's Creek. Okay, just to let you know, and that's Amanda already put it into the put a link to it in the Facebook <laughs> chat. It's already awesome. there. <laughs> awesome, and that's uh, published by Rare Bird Books. Okay, so um, but I do want to really, I do want to talk about this one. <laughs> one with the waves. This is um a young adult novel by Vesna Andrews, but this um I think will appeal to um it's a crossover book for sure. It will will appeal to um um adults who um aren't afraid to uh take you know take a gander into the world of YA. Um, anybody who's interested in 1980s California beach nostalgia, this is great. Um, it's for surfers. Basically, um, a young um, girl's father dies. She's living um, back east with her folks. And um, after her father dies, her mom is just really struggling. And so is she. And so her mom sends her out to um, hang out with her aunt and uncle um, in Manhattan Beach. And um, she's getting bullied, you know, like she's not cool enough. She doesn't have OP shorts and, um, or vans. And, um, but her aunt and uncle are surfers and they teach her how to surf. And it um, is basically the thing that she needs. It's like the healing vibes of the beach, like the whole Zen, thing with uh with um catching waves and um it really um it's how she um really comes of age is through like her love and new passion for surfing um and um i think that this really should it doesn't matter if this is set in manhattan beach it's just a real it's a love letter to 1980s coastal like beach life um, and I, um, can't see how this isn't going to sell all up and down the, um, coastal sea, you know, or the West coast seaboard and beyond. I mean, I don't think, I think it transcends regionality. I just think this is a great book. Um, and also like a strong, um, female protagonist for anybody who, uh, is looking to give, um, a teenager, a gift, um, with that, you know, in mind. So that's from Santa Monica press. Um, based now out of San Diego. <laughs> and, oh, <I'm> really? <laughs> yeah, and that's twelve ninety nine trade paperback. Um, and like everybody loves it. Like pro surfers are digging it. Um, like any anybody who's like interested in the coast. Uh, Chris Shiflet, uh, Foo Fighters guitarist and surfer, is just like um, this is what he says. Early eighties California beach town culture had a very specific flavor. And one with the waves captures it perfectly. The music, the characters, the lingo, the way it felt to stand on the beach, staring out to sea, experience it all again through Ellie's eyes, that's our protagonist, is a trip down memory lane in a story that is equal parts heartache and heartening. How cool is that? That was a great blurb. Yeah. Some really, uh, some really good, uh, strong blurbs from, you know, pro surfers and sailors you know uh, it's just so nice to see this book getting attention and um we think it's just you know all these surfers are stoked and we're stoked okay i love it bring it back to the 80s lingo man cowabunga baby <laughs> we won't talk about what was coming up in those surfboards for mexico we'll we'll, 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 we'll get around with that one later no 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 <laughs> uh, this is uh, pretty this is pretty um this is uh g Rated G. Love it. All right. Yeah. yeah. So okay. it's a perfect little summer sleeper. Love it. Okay, Gabe. 
I'm going to go out with backlist because I had a kind of a light release. I've been talking about a lot of stuff and we just released these really Ooh. great looking jackets. Are these new covers on this? Yeah, we got new covers. I really like the old random paperback cover, but, uh, um, but these are pretty good. good. These are really good. Um, somebody put on Facebook publishers uh, at Vroman's uh, and Edkins. So I used to work with at Vroman's 35 years ago, more than that. Um said publishers if you're going to do repackages this is how you do it so i love it i love it um so name of the rose published in 1983 honestly one of the very first books i sold when i got into the book business came out from hardcore brace Jovanovich, 1983 in the summer wow. and i remember the new york times review had a whole illustration front page illustration it was a big deal literary publication and it garnered the reputation as being a book that a lot of people bought and very few people read <laughs> but um, it's it's not that complicated, and it, it's a, it is a book that you can read on a lot of different levels. Um, but it's just a, it's just a really fun, smart book. And yep. if you like histo smart historical fiction, if you like a really good mystery, he does. A, Echo does a lot of things. He was a genius of sorts. He was uh, into semiotics. Um, but but this is the book that introduced me to Umberto Echo, and I've like read everything he's written since. And then his second book, Folk Calls Pendulum. Um, which uh, was published uh, a couple, three years after that. Uh, another really interesting book that uh, really blew my mind when I got to the end of it. I was like, uh, man, you can't. Anyways, I found it very interesting, but all about human nature. And then uh, another book about the liar. Anyways, he just does a lot of really great things with his books. Um, they've been available. They they have been available forever. They've never gone out of out of print. But I think um, I have been thinking, uh, getting the taste to reread re Name of the Rose. And it's not something, it's a real luxury to reread something these days because there's so much. Yeah, um, so much new stuff. Read. Yeah. And and we get more materials earlier and earlier. So there's always stuff to read for Harper. Yeah. But I really got a taste. It's that, it's that kind of a book. It's a really terrific book that I just have really loved when I read it. And um, I think one of those books worthy enough to to have a second look down the road in my life. Uh, exactly, I was just gonna say that. It's like, it, cause you read it, it's, this one I put in the same category of an instance of the finger post. Oh yeah. With That's those kind good. of, those are just those books that are just so delicious. And it's just like, you read it again and you just pick up on yep. so many different things that you maybe didn't get the first time you read through it. I was, yeah. I, I worked at a bookstore when Foucault's Pendulum <laughs> came out it was the it was on the campus of the university of chicago so it was really a scholarly bookstore and they sold the crap out because echo was beloved uh, everywhere but on the university of chicago campus are you kidding me huge like, oh. <laughs> well yeah. you know and also this um the subject matter can um go back it's like sort of the um the origins of the conspiracies um, that like, you know, lead you to Colin Dickey and the paranoid yeah. style of American politics, yeah. you know, it's yeah. crazy. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Okay, Julia, take us home. Okay, so if you haven't figured it out already, I'm a pop culture nerd. Um, and uh, so mine is called, and don't fuck it up, an oral <laughs> history of the last, the first 10 years of RuPaul's Drag Race. Um, <laughs> this is by wow. Maria Elena Fernandez. Um, if you like me, just um, literally, I had to turn off my little. I usually have an iPad with something playing on it so I can focus when I'm at work, and um, it's usually a drag race <laughs> reruns, <laughs> to be quite honest. Um, but uh, it's if you haven't watched RuPaul's Drag Race, I will say it is like one of the most like touching shows the people on it the stories that they tell about themselves about their lives and the artistry on it and watching these people sometimes they show up at the show as like you know they're pretty good entertainers they're pretty good drag queens and then you watch them really like blossom <laughs> while they get, where they're on the show it's so much fun to watch and this is an oral history of sort of how they took you know, those early elements. And if you watch season one, like any Drag Race fan will tell you to start probably at season five. One could fight me about season four or three, but <laughs> but um, 
but those early elements where they fi- where they're sort of figuring it out so so you get a total history of like okay when we realized this thing was actually really working or this thing was really working and how we sort of change how you can sort of shape and sculpt reality television to start telling those mm. stories um and these just gorgeous stories of these queens that came a lot of them come from nothing and nowhere right. and you watch them just sort of like become these amazing artists and um, and I mean, not that they aren't when they get to the show, but they really like flourish yeah. on. But it just like takes them to the next level. They're there, yeah, but totally. then it just takes them to the next level. Yeah. So it's a really fun book. Um, it's one for any fan, any like of your friends or family that's um, that are fans of Drag Race, um, or perhaps you. This should be fans they of Drag Race. <laughs> I, I I think I need to get it with that for my daughter because we would watch all of the different shows that <laughs> RuPaul's and all of them. It's just so much yeah. fun. My favorite story though was when um we did the virtual event with Elvira Cassandra, uh-huh. and I can't remember the name of the queen that was on with it, but he but she called Hachette Hachetti. It could have been the most fun. <laughs> all of us that were like we were all of them amazing. Like, <laughs> he kept calling it Hachetti, and we were dying. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> I don't know if we have like the um I don't know if we have the recording of it somewhere but oh my god whichever queen it was she was correct I'll just say that yeah Yeah. I mean it was Hachetti yeah rhymes with spaghetti exactly all right I can't remember if I clogged because I think I was reading bad summer people a couple weeks ago and I forgot to get because I was in the middle of it and I forgot to give the wrap-up last week because I literally read it in two days it's the best summer read out there. It's just so deliciously bad about there's when I say deliciously bad, I think people think I think said that the book's bad. The book is not bad. It's great. There just is not a character that you are going to like in this book at all. The mystery sucks. It's not if they said it's a, it's a thriller thing. It's like, don't even don't read it because of the mystery. Um, because it, you all know me. I hate that there's never a twist that's good enough for me. Um, but just how bad these people are is so great. And so pick up bad summer people. All right. All right, everybody. It was Peaches Christ. It was Peaches Christ. Julie, oh, who, a, yeah. an amazing drag queen. An amazing queen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's a San Francisco, San Francisco drag queen. Okay. So she was, yeah, she Peaches was, Christ. oh yeah. RuPaul, Peaches Christ. RuPaul, one of the most quotable, um, lines he's ever delivered. Everybody is born naked. The rest is drag. There you go. There you go. We will end on that note. (laughs) Look for the RuPaul biography coming from Harper in the winter of 24. Okay, so right on. There was a RuPaul book that he had that he wrote, and he's from San Diego. And I tried so hard. I was going to take him down to the bow boy. It's like, come to San Diego, for goodness sakes. I did. I will say I did an event with him when I was at Book Soup, and he was the most generous, one of the most generous authors I've ever worked with. Oh, I bet um, it's just, I bet his signing line takes hours. Oh, it took forever. But like, you know, I was, you know, Julie, how it goes, you're like, do you need me to like, I will speed these people through. And he was like, uh-uh, nope. And mm-hmm. talked to every single one for like multiple minutes and everyone, he was like, I love that sweater. I love that, you know, like just yeah. was a, a consummate gentleman and and very tall i so want to i have my little checklist of people there it's getting less and less because i've been doing this job for so long and i've met lots <laughs> of really really cool people but he's one that it's less like i'd love to meet him so, all right we'll, anyway, we'll join forces we'll see. and see we'll join forces and well, maybe we'll drive up to Get la to together you. and go because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i'm sure i'll do something in la all right, everybody. Happy reading. Stay cool wherever you're at. Stay safe. Um, it's a crazy weather out there for everyone. So, um, but good books. I, summer's becoming the new hybrid. You don't hibernate in winter anymore. You hibernate in summer. Stay inside. Yeah, right. Stay cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, everybody. See y'all next week. <laughs>